My name is Blanca Turubiate hyphen Simpson, T U R R U B I A T E hyphen S I M P S O N. Good morning. Good morning. Is this difficult for you to be here today? Yes, sir, it is. <clears throat> Will you please tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury, uh, Mr. Simpson, about yourself, where you're from, your family if you want to, and um, just kind of what you've been doing in life leading up to today, generally, please. Yes, sir. I, um, I'm originally from Brownsville, Texas. I um, joined the mili military at the age of 17. Um, I was in Norfolk, Virginia for almost nine and a half years. I was stationed on the USS Puget Sound, USS Shenandoah, Naval Air Station Oceana right before I left. Um, What'd you do there? Heavy equipment operator. Okay. And um, my husband was also heavy equipment operator. We were both in the same field. Um, we decided that um, the military was just not gonna be um, good environment for raising children, so we made a decision instead of moving to Texas, we moved to South Carolina, um, where he was from. And um, we have uh, five children, 34, 31, 23, 21, and a 17-year-old that are all been raised down here in South Carolina. Any of them still at home? Yes, sir, 17-year-old. Um, where was your husband from? You said he moved back home. Where was he from? Um, my husband's originally from um, Gifford, South Carolina. Say it again. Gifford, South Gifford. Carolina. Okay. And um, what does he do? He's a police officer for Hampton. When you came to South Carolina, you'd never, never been here before, correct? No, sir. Okay. Um, what did you do when you got here besides the hardest job in the world being a mom and raising kids what what did you what else did you do um when we moved here we had enough leave built that we didn't have to work for almost two months so i went to um after about a week i kind of got bored because i'm used to having hands on doing something so i went to the local piggly wiggly store in town and i asked the I didn't know he was the owner at the time. I realized he was the owner after. If I could get a job because I was bored. And um, how many kids do you have? I have five. Okay. But I only had the two <clears throat> oldest ones okay. at that time. And um, so he said the only job he had was a stalker, and I actually had no idea what that meant because I had just graduated <clears throat> high school and went in the military, so I didn't know but I told him I would take it as long as it would get me out of the house for a little bit. So, so um, I took that job and then within a week I got a call from another um, job that I had put in where it was brazing or welding at Scotsman, which is in Allendale County. And I figured, well, it offers benefits and it would be better transition for the kids, dental, you know, that sort of thing. So I went there after about, Two weeks, another job called me and had better dental um, medical benefits for my kids. So that was the first time I ever, well, I went to work for the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Um, I opened up Ridgeland Correctional Institution. I was the first class to graduate from Ridgeland Correctional <coughs> Institution. I worked my way up from correctional officer to sergeant. Um, I manage the outside details and the work road crew on the interstate. Also, a, a crew that would go out to Hunting Island for maintenance to assist with the park rangers. Um, in 2001, I was offered a job at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and um, I accepted the job. So I left Ridgeland Correctional Institution, went to work for FCI Estill, Federal Correctional Institution Estill, South Carolina. Um, where I stayed until 2007. My job basically, I started back from the bottom as a correctional officer and before my years up, I got promoted to um, the special investigative support 
to um, tech office where I was responsible for managing, um, well, producing reports, weekly reports, and also um, profiling the Hispanic gangs because there was not a lot of um, staff members that were bilingual. So my job basically became profiling, interviewing, um, and associating members, the inmate population with gangs. And how long did you do that? From 2001 to 2007. Not that anybody cares, but is that when I first met you? Yes, sir. Did you help me arrange a meeting with a prisoner I need to interview? Yes, sir. And why did you leave that job? Just burned, when you're the only um, one of the only ones in the office that's, that's bilingual and you're constantly getting called out for different incidents dealing with a Hispanic population. Hispanic population that had grown up quite a bit from the time I got there. Um, and still having to do um, your daily duties in the office and nobody's helping you. It, you tend to burn out pretty quick. So, um, so if an incident, I made a decision to leave. Okay. So if an incident happened when they needed a translator I Your was phone call, got called. I, was, I had to stop what I was doing and respond to whatever incident dealing with the Hispanic inmates. What did you do after that? I um, went into real estate for a little bit, which was not so good because that's when the market crashed. And, and again, for my, well, for the jury's edification, what year is this when you quit the prison? And 2007. Okay. And you're living where? In Brunson. I'm sorry. Brunson. <clears throat> so how, how long did you stay in real estate? Maybe about a year and a half. Um, your family's grown at this point, I presume? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, did there come a point that you met the defendant, Alex Murdoch? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you tell them how that happened? Tell the ladies and gentlemen how that transpired. When I, when I first moved to um, Gifford with my husband, um, like I said, I was bored, so I went to work at the grocery store. At the grocery store, um, and during the time that I moved, there was not a lot of Hispanic families living in that area. Um, it has since grown in the years. Um, I, met, uh, I met a lady who I befriended. You know, um, she was uh, Hispanic. And... Um, we started talking because she was the only other Hispanic person that I had actually seen in the area. So we started talking back and forth and it was nice, nice to speak in your native tongue with somebody. Um, and um, her son had an accident at the school on his way um, after school walking to the car and he had gotten hurt. Um, one of the ladies that, that worked at the school had recommended that she um, use an attorney from Walterboro and um, a couple of months had gone by and I noticed that um, there was a, she was under a lot of stress. And as, she, as, um, as I talked to her, she said, I just have to get all these documents. I don't understand. She still, she spoke English, but it was very broken English. So she was having a difficult time explaining what she needed for the attorney. So I told her, I said, well, I said, I'm going to find you an attorney. I'll, um, I'll look around, I said, and we'll go ahead and fire that attorney and hire you a new one. And because um, we didn't want the statute of limitations to run out on her case. So at that point, I started looking around, and I happened to walk into the law firm. And um, it was the old offices um, where I met Alex. Just walked in, and that's where you met the defendant, Alex Murdoch. Yes, sir. Okay, and you were trying to assist this individual who was having trouble communicating with her prior attorney. Don't mention whoever that attorney was, but you helped her get a new attorney. Yes, sir. Um, did you help with that case, that particular case with this friend? Yes, sir. He told me he would um, take the case. Who is he? Who's Alex told? told me he would he would take the case as long as I translate it and help him with the details. Um, because he didn't have anybody in the office that was bilingual, and I agreed. You were a hot commodity, weren't you? <laughs> I mean, there was a need for translators. Yes, sir. Um, so you helped with that case. 
Yes, sir. I did. Did, did you assist in other cases with the? Yes, sir. I did. At times, Alec would call me and ask him if I could assist in translating or um, when there were accidents and the folks were um, injured. Um, and if they were not, if they did not speak the English language, um, he would ask me to translate. And were you getting paid for this service? Yes, sir. Um, he would. It wasn't a set fee. It was just depending on the case, you know, whatever I did, whether it was to get him signed up with a law firm, um, basically, you know, or if I had any um, type of, um, in, in the Hispanic community, when you, when you are in trouble or you're in need of something and a lot of times those accidents when they happen in the area they are not um from here the, the language barrier is a is a big thing for them so my instinct was more to make sure that they were well accommodated and they whatever they needed so sometimes um he would reimburse me for my out-of-pocket whenever i helped the individuals you know who were in the accident and that went on for a period of time when you were assisting either Alex Murdoch or the law firm, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did that change into a um, caregiver, if you will, or respectfully, I don't mean housekeeper or whatever term you'd like to call it for Maggie Murdoch? Yes, sir. Um, Alex had called me and said Maggie was looking for um, a person to help her in the home. And at that point, real estate wasn't really doing much um, for me. And so I told I couldn't find anybody I, I had asked around. Um, and at that point, I told him, I said, well, I'll help her. And he was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, I'll help her. I said, it's no big deal to me. It's honest work. So um, I said and that I would help her. You were clearly qualified. Yes, sir. Um, so what did you start doing for Either the Murdahls or Ma Maggie Murdahl. I started helping um, the other ladies in the house with the cleaning, with um, running errands, um, going running to the bank for her, um, whatever she needed me to do. And when did that start, Ms. Blanc? In 2007. Okay. <clears throat> and were the two young children, or the two children, uh, Paul and Buster Murdahl, were they younger at the Obviously, they were younger. When you yes, sir, they were young. And would you have interaction with them and or Alex Murdahl during this time period? Yes, sir. H how often were you working for the Murdahls? At that point, it was maybe every other day, um, depending on how, how, how often she needed me. Okay. And um, where was that? Where specifically were you working? Where was their house? At the house in, on Holly Street in Hampton. How long did that go on before you stopped? For, and tell them why you stopped. Um, I, I worked there with them on and off, like I said, not on and off, I shouldn't say that. Um, every, every two to three days, you know, or it wasn't a, a daily thing at that point. Then I did go probably about maybe, I, I can't recall whether it was a few months later or a couple, a, or a couple of weeks later, um, there was an incident at the house and um, somebody had tried to burn the house. So that's when I actually went and started helping her more full time because she had to go through a lot of, um, a lot of the damages and all that helped her. I helped her document a lot of whatever damages were done from the diesel and stuff that was spilt all throughout the house by and, the individual. And maybe I wasn't clear on my question. Did, did there come a point where you had some health issues? Yes, sir. Um, at one point, um, I suffered a stroke, and I had to um, stop working um, and go through rehab for a while. And what year was that? Um, Seventeen or eighteen, maybe. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So prior to your stroke and you had to go to rehab, re rehab how long did you work for the Murdoch's? That was a few years by then. How long 
were you out after you had your stroke? Blanca. Maybe f almost four years. Did there come a point where you went back and started working with Alex, with the Bernal family? Yes, sir. And, and tell these folks when that was? Um, shortly after the shortly after the um, boating accident um, I um, reached out to Alex and Maggie and I told them if they needed anything that they could um, call on me and at that point Maggie um, said that she would li like for me to come back if I was able to so I told her I would um, at that point I was feeling better so I, I told her that I would go back and uh, once I went back it was like I actually never left. I was just informed the stroke was in 2015 not 2017 mm -hmm. I yes, apologize. Sir. Yes, sir. So after your recovery you started working and actually called them the Murdoch family and said if y'all need anything. If, we, if y'all need anything you know I'm here. Um, and, and I don't think anybody will dispute that was in February of 2019. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So when you went back to work with the family after the boating accident, tell tell these folks what were your duties then? What was your job? Um, I started right back at the same thing. I was helping with the cleaning. I was helping running errands. I would cash checks. I would. Um, and what I say by cashing checks for Maggie, sometimes she didn't have time or she was busy doing other things, so she would send me to the bank to cash checks um, to pay the people that, were, that she had working around the house. Uh, the Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. The ma maintenance, line, you know, that sort of thing, whatever she was doing around the house. And where were they living, the Murdoch family, at this point in 2019? Both places. Okay, and tell the folks where, where both places. Moselle and um, Hampton. So you're working at both residences? Yes, sir, I both. And did there come a time where they moved uh, exclusively for the primary residence to, well, where was their primary residence? Their primary residence was um, Holly Street, and once they sold the house, they moved straight into Moselle full time. We hadn't heard much about Maggie, and I was limited what I can say in a murder case, but did y'all get um, fairly close? Yes, sir. And when you had quit working for her and you had your stroke, <coughs> did you ever see her during that time period when you weren't working for her? Yes, sir. M Maggie would, um, I would see her in town, and uh, she would often uh, signal me to pull over, so we just used to stop sometimes and uh, just talk and see how things were going at the local um, CVS. Just to catch up? Just to catch up and see how everybody was doing. And, and prior when you were working and after, would you, and I'm not asking you to say what, but <coughs> y'all got close and would talk personal things? Yes, sir. I'd like for you to go back in your mind now and take this jury back to um, June 7th, 2021. Yes, sir. Um, you were working there for the Murnaughs then? Yes, sir. Okay. That's a Monday. Do we all know that, June 7th? Yes, sir. When had you worked prior to that? At, At the Moselle property for them? Friday. And at that point, had you seen, what family members did you see at Moselle on Friday, which would have been the June 4th of 2021? Do you remember? Paul. Okay. And um, what was your interaction with Paul that day? Paul walked through the door, um, his usual self. Um, I was walking out of the laundry room coming into the kitchen and Paul came in the front door and he was holding a, um, a laundry basket full of, full of clothes. 
And uh, as he was approaching me, he saw me and he said, what, what's up, Ms. B? And uh, I just looked at him, I said, boy, I said, if you got all them dirty clothes and you want me to take care of that, I said, I'm getting ready to leave. He's like, oh, come on, Miss B. You can help me out. He said, I need them for the weekend. He said, I said, well, just pull a couple of them out what you need and I'll, I'll take care of it. And uh, I ended up staying late to make sure that he had his um, clothing ready for the weekend. So you, did you wash the clothes for the entire family? Was that part of your? Yes, sir, I did. And did Paul leave that Friday? Yeah, I saw him leave. I don't know whether he was actually gone for the weekend or if he was still. And did you ever see him again? No, sir. Did you have um, regular hours in June of 2021 that you worked at Moselle for the Murdoch family? They weren't really set hours. Maggie was pretty, um, she, she was just easygoing. If I had stuff to do, if I had stuff to take care of, um, she wasn't really too keen on any specific hours. Um, so, you know, if I had a doctor's appointment or if I had anything, she'd be like, okay, no, her main thing was, her main comment to me always was no worries. No worries. No worries. Well, June 7th specifically, were you scheduled to work at Mazelle? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you have contact with Miss Maggie Murdoch sometime prior to getting to Mazelle that morning? Yes, sir. Okay. And I think it's in evidence, but tell these folks what contact you had with her. Um, she, um, she texted me and asked me if I could stop at the um, grocery store on my way to Moselle because Alex wanted some Capri Suns. Wanted some what? Capri Suns. Okay. Um, and she said uh, apple and I believe she said pineapple first and then they changed. She came back with another text and said, no, he wants orange, I believe that's what he said. That's what the text said, I'm not. And did you try to get some orange Capri Suns? Yes. Sir. Where'd you go? I went to the um, Food Lion. And were you successful in your search for no, orange sir. Capri Suns? No, sir. Was Mark states 54, Sparka. Excuse me, defendants 54 for the record. Did you have any other texts with Miss Maggie before you got to Mazelle? Yes, Maggie. Um, Maggie um, told me she had to go to a doctor's appointment, and she said that um, in the text, Maggie said, Alec wants me to come home, and um, she said, um, and in a phone conversation, she, she told me, she said, um, I left some food in the refrigerator. Um, is there any way that you can cook? Paul likes the way you cook. So um, she said, because I don't think I'll be back in time. So I said, yeah, sure. I said, I'll do it. So it was nothing. I finished what I was doing, and then I started cooking, making sure the meal was ready um, for when Paul and they, they arrived at home, well, that afternoon. And um, we had another conversation on the phone um, where um, she told me, she said, Alec wants me to come home. And she kind of sounded like she didn't want to come home um, and uh, she because she really liked being at Edisto and they had a lot of work that was going on and she was trying to make sure everything was ready um, for the 4th of July gathering that they she was planning so she wanted she was very detail orientated so she wanted everything perfect so she was kind of she sounded like she was a little disappointed and then she said well um, 
Alec asked Paul to come home too because he's got to fix the mess up out there that the um, that C B had um, done. Um, that C B road. Yes, sir. And he said Alec Alec had told Paul to come and fix it because they were planning on uh, having a hunt that weekend, so he wanted everything ready and good to go. So he'd ask Maggie to come, and then he'd ask Alex to come. That's what Excuse Maggie. Me, Paul to come. Paul. That's what Maggie told me over the phone. And, and looking at states, excuse me, Defendants 54, uh, can you read that? Text. He said, thank you. I'm waiting at doctor. Alex wants me to come home. I had to leave. Door open at Edisto, but trust Mexicans to shut and lock for me. His dad is back in the hospital. The last doctor claims not cancer, it pneumonia. And then she's got some emojis. She said, Alec is about to die. Hope he doesn't go down there to sleep. Needs to take care of himself as well. And when she said, I trust the Mexicans leave the door open, that didn't bother you? No, sir. Okay. Um, my, when she said, I guess my question is, you said you didn't think she wanted to. Mr. Mellis, you're standing in front of the jurors. <laughs> When um, you had just testified, you didn't think she wanted to come home. Well, she get was work being done at Edisto. Yes, sir. Okay. And did she like being at Edisto? Yes, sir. She did. And when would she stay at Edisto? Any chance she had. Okay. Where well, was a time of year that she liked being there more than other times? Yes, sir. Come around spring. Um, summer, she preferred to be in Edisto. Um, and I guess, um, was she at Edisto the night, Sunday night, do you know? Where, where was she Sunday night? I'm not sure. Call it speculation, unless she knows. She can answer if she knows. I'm not sure. Were you on schedule June 7th time-wise? Were you running late? Were you? What no. time were you supposed to be there? I didn't, have, I didn't have a set time to be there. After you and Maggie talked and texted, um, did you go to Moselle? Yes, I did. And when you got there, was Maggie there? No, sir. She had just left. Was Paul there? No. Uh, was defendant Alex Murdahl there? Yes, he was. Okay. When you walked in the house, was he up? No, sir. He was in bed. He was in bed. Based on the time you spent there and your experience with the defendant Alex Murdahl, was he a morning person? No, sir. No, sir. How long were you there working before you saw Alex Murdahl? That morning on June 7th of 21? Probably a couple hours. And can you tell these folks that there come a point that morning where he left the house? Alex Murdoch, did he, did he leave and go to work or Yes, wherever? he did. Okay. And can you tell them what he was wearing, Alex Murdoch, best of your memory when he left Moselle? He had a pair of um, khaki pants, um, a green, greenish, I call it seafoam color. Um, polo shirt and he put a sports coat, a blue sports coat over it. And he put his shoes on which were usually right there next to um, a dresser that they had right there um, in, the, in the living room area. That's where his shoes used to go right there so he just used to kind of slide his shoes on on his way out the door. Do you remember what type of shoes he had on on June 7th, 2021 when he left? His regular work shoes. That, um, the brown, there was a pair of brown leather shoes. Was it a long sleeve shirt or a short sleeve shirt he left on? 
The polo's a short sleeve shirt. And um, staying out of everybody's view, do you remember anything specifically about that shirt? Um, as he put his coat on, he, he was putting his shoes on and he was try, putting his coat on um, and he was getting ready to walk out. He turned around and I said, Alec, I said, um, hold on a minute. I said, your collar's sticking up. So I, I, um, he turned around and I fixed his collar inside his jacket because one collar was sticking up. So on you his actually shirt. helped, I'm sorry, but you helped move his shirt? Yeah, yes, I did. And you said it was a long or short sleeve, I'm sorry. That polo is a short sleeve. And did it have buttons on part of it or, or do you know? Just from, from here to here. And, and was it a blue blazer it was, on top of it? It was a dark color. He put a tie on? Excuse he didn't me? have a tie with that on? No, sir. I just, where's ties anymore? Now, Ms. Maggie had asked you to fix dinner for the uh, family. Did you do that? I did. Can you tell them what you make? Um, she called it steak burger, but it's cube steak and gravy, um, some white rice, and some green beans. You go cook, aren't you? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> Did you see or talk to Maggie ever again after this text or this phone call? Before I left Moselle, I texted her and I said um, the dinner was on the, I believe I texted to the effect that the, I left dinner on the stove for them. And um, that I, I, I can't really remember the text, but I did text her and let her know that the dinner was ready and that I was leaving. And you said one of her phrases she used is no worries. Had she said that to you that day? Yes. When was that? Um, it I, can't, I can't remember. You got a family of your own, right? Yes, sir. Did you, when you left Moselle, what did you do? Pick up my son at school. Okay. And uh, your husband's working? Yes, sir. Law enforcement? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you got home that night, um, did anybody call you that night? No. When did you hear about the murder at Moselle of Paul and Maggie Murdoch? The next morning when I was getting ready to go out there. The next morning? Yes, sir. Okay. How did you hear? Alex called me. And, and what did he tell you? He, didn't call, he called you the next morning? He called me early the next morning. Okay. And what did he say to you? He, um, he sounded shaky on the phone. You could tell he was, I, his voice sounded really shaky. Um, and uh, he said, um, B, they're gone, they're gone. And that my initial thought was, did she go back to Edisto? Um, I thought, that thought didn't cross my mind that he meant that they were dead at that time. You just didn't comprehend no, what was sir, going on? No, sir, I did not. So he told me again, he said, no, B, they're, they're, they're dead. Um, and at that point, I don't remember because I believe I dropped the phone, my husband got the phone. I don't remember after that. You literally dropped the phone? Yes. And did your husband get on the phone? I, I, don't, okay. I don't remember. I, I, I don't remember. I, I, all I remember is when he said that they were dead. I, I, I dropped the phone. And I believe I said, I'll be right over. I'll be right over. Um, but, um, did, did, did he, the defendant, Alex Murdoch, mm -hmm. tell you which way to go when you got to the house? Well, he said him and Buster were at Almeda, so I told him I was um, going to Almeda. You know, I wanted to make sure they were okay, and, and um, so I went from my house to Almeda. And then um, when I got ready to leave Almeda, he said, well, when you go to the house, go in the front because there's a lot of sled agents by the kennels. You can't go in that way. 
And he said, just try to straighten up um, the way Maggie liked everything. You know, in the house, he said, you knew her the best. He said, you know how she likes stuff. So I, um, I did, I went to the house. So you went to Al? I went to Moselle. You went to Almeida. Almeida to start with? Yes, I did, to check on my buster and Alec. To comfort him? Yes, sir. And um, at his request, you went to Moselle to start cleaning up and getting the house in order? Yes, sir. He said there was going to be people probably stopping by and um, bringing food and, and stuff. He said, I just want the house to look the way Maggie would like for it to look. So I said, okay. And I went to the house. I, I um, Did you have a usual way that you went in? to Moselle entrance wise? From the house, I would, if I was coming from my house, I would come in on the, I call it the Miley side. So I would actually enter the property through the kennels. And um, if I was coming from Hampton or if I, you know, in the, the other direction, then I would use the front entrance. But normally I use the kennel entrance coming from my house. When you got to Moselle, we're now on the morning of June 8th, right, of 2021? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you see anybody in the property before you got to the main house? No, sir. Um, and when you got to the main house, take us right there. Like right now as you're walking in the house, what were your observations? It was hard because I know she wasn't going to be coming back. And I didn't want to move. I didn't want to move her stuff. It was just a weird feeling going through when I walked, when I unlocked the front door to get in. felt cold. You really cared for her, didn't you? I did. What'd you do when you got inside? Um, when I got inside, I, um, I didn't turn on any lights. I didn't do anything. I, want, I walked through the front door and I went in the kitchen. And uh, I was kind of, I was kind of, when I looked in the kitchen, I kind of got, I kind of just stopped in my tracks and I looked at the stove and I, I was kind of, I don't know what, what the word is, when I looked and I noticed the stove that there was no pots on the stove, it was kind of unusual because usually when they ate dinner, um, when they ate dinner the night before, the pots usually stayed on the, on the stove. Very, very seldom would she um, put, you know, certain meals in the refrigerator. A lot of times it was just left on the, on the stove um, until the next day. And um, the pots were not, they were not in the sink and they were not on the stove. And then as I walked through, I um, walked, if you walk through the kitchen, like you're going to, from the kitchen, if you walk through the kitchen, um, if you go to the left, there's two, a uh, freezer and a refrigerator and the laundry room sat right there to the left. There's a back door to the back porch and then there's the laundry room door. They're both right there. And as I turned to go to the laundry room, I noticed that there was, her pajamas were in the middle of the doorway, um, it, right in the middle, laid neatly in the middle of the doorway going into the laundry room. It was her pajama pants, a pair of underwear and her um, her pajama top 
Was that unusual? That was very unusual. Wow. Um, because she would she wouldn't lay her clothes out like that, not in the middle of the door like that. It it just didn't look right to me. And you took care of the house. Yes. You took care of the clothes. Yes. And I, uh, not to get too personal, but sometimes you can't help it. Well, the underwear there with the pajamas unusual. Yes. Why? She didn't. She didn't wear underwear with her pajamas. No underwear with pajamas. But that struck. No your, underclothes with the pajamas. But that struck you as unusual. They were there with the pajamas. Yes, sir, because the underwear appeared to be uh, clean, not not dirty. They they still had like fold marks. In the pots, and I may have just missed it. You said uh, where would the pots end up when you um, found them? After I, I looked at the pajamas on the on the floor, the way that they were set, I turned around and I said, "Well, I wonder where the pots are." So I happened to. I opened the refrigerator door, and the pots were sitting inside the refrigerator with lids on them. And I was like, you know, who did this? Um, I, I don't know at that point, but that was not normal for the pot, the whole pot to be sitting in the fridge. Did you make any other observations uh, in the house, the bathroom, or anywhere else? In the, in the master bathroom um, was, um, her clothes were sitting next to the the tub. It was a small pile of clothes right there next to the tub. Um, and to, by the shower, um, if you walk in the master bedroom, there's a big garden tub, spa, spa type tub. And then right here is the shower and there's a window. On the floor next to the shower was um, a slight puddle of water, a towel, and a pair of khaki pants. And then, and then um, as I went to the left to see if there was anything else that was out, I um, looked in the closet, and in the closet was a white uh, damp towel on the floor, and there was a, a and I'm pretty sure the t-shirt was white at one time, but you know, they get kind of dingy after a few years. But that, it, it appeared that a t-shirt had fallen off of the stack of t-shirts that were on top of the shelf right there in the closet. Um, it was laying on the floor next to the towel. Wait, wait, when you took care of the home, was that, t tell us how the clothes were laid out, the shirts, the shorts were, you saying up on the shelf or the shirts, how were um, in the closet, there was a shelf. Um, there was some shelves, smaller shelves right here. Then there was some long ones. Maggie used to keep her clothes on these. And then there was a shorter one, kind of like little uh, box looking, you know. Up. Alex used to keep his clothes, his belts and stuff in that. Um, and then on top, there was also an area where he kept T-shirts. Um, they were folded and they were kept on the shelf. When you say T-shirts, I know what a T-shirt is, but I mean, were they T-shirts like I'm wearing it right was, now? Or were they T-shirts with pockets? It was what usually was it? they would um, be T-shirts like if they would go, like when you go to a restaurant and they have like the logo of the, those type of T-shirts. He, he had a big collection of those. And, and would you put them on the shelf? Yes, sir, I did. Did you iron T-shirts? Yes, sir, I did. And you, you washed all the clothes? Yes, I did. Did he have a certain place that he kept shorts versus long pants? Yes, sir. When you walk in the master bedroom, there, when you enter the master bedroom, the bed, the bed was right here. At the foot of the bed, you had a dresser here and a dresser here. Um, the right dresser on the top drawers were usually his underwear, his socks. The next drawer was his T-shirts. On the bottom drawer were the pajama pants that he would wear or his shorts that he would wear to sleep in. In the left drawer, and one sits on this 
this side of the door going into the bathroom and the other one's right here. On the left dresser, he kept his white t-shirts that he would wear under when he wore a suit. He would wear, the t-shirts were in one of those drawers. And then the other two drawers were shorts, um, the dressier shorts and then the, um, the not so dressier shorts. You know that. So you testified a shirt looked like it had fallen when you saw it this morning? Yes, sir. June 8, 2021, okay. Was it still clean? Yes, sir. Did you put it back? Yes, sir. My boss, Don Zelenka, just reminded me that the food that you um, cooked, did you look and see how much was eaten in the pots? No, sir, I did not. Okay. Now, you said there was a damp towel. Where was that? In the closet on the floor. Okay. And I know what damp means, but when you touched it, did it feel? It was damp. Okay. What did you do with it? Took it to the laundry room. And you said there were some pants there. Yes, yeah, so there's a pair of khakis by the shower. And what did you do with those? Took them to the laundry room. Did you wash them? Yes, sir. Can we go to the... Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, Mr. Harpoon and Mr. Waters, if you all would be seated. <coughs> Ms. Simpson. Yes, sir. I think where we left off, um, well, uh, let me kind of try to refocus myself. I'm going to show you what's entered as state seven. Just, can you see those pants in state seven? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recognize those you pants? Can I hear your response? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. You recognize those pants in state seven? Yes, sir. And how do you know those? How do you recognize them? I took care of the laundry. Have you cleaned them? Yes, sir. Okay. Where were these pants um, kept in State 7? The left, um, the left dresser and the third drawer, third, third or fourth drawer. You know they, weren't, they weren't in the ones where um, he had one drawer with shorts that he would usually wear on the, on the weekends, you know, the dressier ones. Those were kept in the drawer underneath that specific drawer. So you know what drawers these were in? Yes. Okay. If you know from being there and taking care of the clothes and taking care of the family, were these... His shorts he liked to wear a lot or not? Did you see him in these shorts much? No. Okay. And were these shorts clean the last time you saw them? Yes. Okay. Now this shirt that's also in States 7, had you seen that shirt before? Yes, sir. Okay. Where was this shirt kept in the closet at Moselle? The the top shelf um, above his where his clothes hang, the, the top shelf. 
There was a shelf up there. And you've testified it looked like a shirt had fallen from that shelf when you got there on the morning of June 8th, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Was this shirt kept in that same place as the shirt that had fallen? Yes, sir. And the shirt that had fallen, what did you do with it after you picked it up? I folded it back up and I put, placed it back on, on the shelf. Was it clean? Ma'am, yes, I understand that you all are apparently having a personal conversation, but you need to speak into the mic. Yes, sir. All right, look at me this way. I'm sorry. Had you cleaned this shirt that's in, that's in State 7 uh, prior to June 7th of 2021? I probably did. And where would it have been placed after you cleaned it? Where would you have put it? Up, up in the closet if there was no more room in the drawer. Now, could we please uh, play States 306, please? Can you see, can, would you look right there at your monitor? They're fixing that when Mr. Mark. Okay, you freeze it right there. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, this, uh, who's in the picture? Alex. Okay. And, and can you tell what kind of pants he's got on? Khaki pants. Okay. Can you tell what kind of shoes he's got on from that, Miss Simpson? It appears to be the uh, pair of loafers. Loafers? Mm -hmm. House house shoes, loafers. Okay, well tell me what you mean by house shoes. Um, just his shoes that he would usually wear around the house if he was wearing shoes. Mm -hmm. So would he usually just wear them inside? Yes, sir. But these appear to be those shoes? It appears to be, yes. And, and this shirt that Alex Murdahl is wearing on June 7th depicted in states 306 had you seen that shirt prior to june 7th it was in the closet okay and what type of shirt is that the columbia shirt columbia shirt yes sir okay and how many of those type shirts did he have he had a few in the closet and, and what color is that shirt just like a greenish aqua seafoam color what? Why do you keep using the term seafoam? I'm not fussing, I'm just asking. The term seafoam, when Maggie was um, looking at different color palettes to paint, that color came up in one of the color palettes. So we would refer to it as a seafoam. Um, but that's the term that was used for that color in one of the color palettes um, that she had. After June 7th, of 2021 did you ever see that shirt again no sir there was like a pink one a white one a baby blue in the closet i do not remember that shirt being in there and on june 8th of 2021 in the morning hours when you came back over there was that shirt there no sir were these shoes that you called house slippers were those there no sir did you ever see those house shoes again? No, sir. And where did he usually keep them? In the closet. <coughs> did he have any other type shoes? Canvas or any kind of boat shoes? He had a lot of shoes in the closet. Do you remember any shoes that were canvas type shoes? The, 
boat shoes, like the Sperry. Sperry shoes? Yes, sir. And do you remember those? Yes, sir. They used, they used to sit in the closet. They used to sit in the closet. Mm -hmm. After June 7th of 2021, did you ever see the Sperry boat shoes again? No, sir. I do not recall seeing them in the closet. Never, ever? No, sir. Did you stay on and work for a period of time for Alex Murdahl at the Moselle? Yes, sir, I did. And did your day-to-day -day functions change after June 7th as far as Moselle itself? Yes, sir, they did. Well, tell them how that happened and what the change was. Um, after Ali, after Ali, after Maggie and Paul were um, were killed, um, Alec um, did not stay on the property. On the tenth, when I believe his father passed away, after Swiss the murder. yes, I believe after the service that we had for him at the cemetery, Alec called and asked if my husband and I would. Um, stay on the property because him and Buster were not going to be able to stay there. So we agreed to take care of the property and, and um, maintain it while he, he said uh, until he decides what he's going to do with it. And, and did in fact you and your husband start <coughs> residing there for a period of time? We did. And, and what, uh, were, you, were you paid for that? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, do you mind telling them how much? He would give me 1500 a week to make sure that anything needed for the farm was taken care of. And my husband and I would maintain cutting the grass um, on that property, which is a lot of grass out there. And it would take in excess of two days to cut. Would you cut it? Yes, sir. My I would help my husband. Were you also taking care of the dogs? Yes, sir. Tell these folks what were the dogs' names? Grady and Bubba. Grady and Bubba. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, you fed them? Yes, sir. Took care of them? Yes, sir. Where is Bubba? What's today? Whatever today is, where is Bubba today? He's with me. So you have Bubba in your home? Yes, sir, I do. Did Bubba have his own pen? Yes, he did. And, and I don't know if you've seen, but could, at some point, and I'll keep going to the video of, um, well, could we play that now, please? Can we get it to the video, the kennel video? Please. What is it? And before, oh, Craig, before we get there, when, 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 and I'm sorry, I'm going back to this real quick. Is that the shirt he left for the office in that day? No, sir. Okay. Go ahead. <coughs> Had you ever seen Bubba with a, an animal in his mouth? Yes, sir. All right, tell him about that, please. Please, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when Bubba was running around, if I would, if I or anybody, we, if the chickens were running out of the coop. He would chase the chickens, and he would just go after the chickens or the guineas, whatever was out there. And would you ever catch him? Yes, he would. Right. And how would Bubba, the chicken, get out of Bubba's mouth? And you have to make several attempts to to get the chicken out of his mouth, and at points he would growl at you if you tried to take his toy. I be basically that's what he. In your experience in being there, was it easier for a family member or somebody Bubba knew to get the chicken out? It, if he, he's stubborn. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> but would it take a period of time to get the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? Yes, it would. Okay. August 
list of 2021. Ms. Blanco. Yes, sir. Uh, did you have a conversation with Alex Murdahl about a shirt? Yes, I did. And, and let's go back. Where did this take place? At the little house. All right. What do you mean the little house? Um, after, after Paul and Maggie were killed, Paul, uh, um, Alec was not staying at Moselle. My husband and I were, and he would often stay in different places. But all his clothes and um, toiletries and everything were placed in the house that sits um, between Mr. Johnny Parker and his brother Randy. There's a small two-bedroom house right there, and that's where all his belongings at the time went. And where is that located? In Hampton. Okay, in Hampton. And who furnished this little house with clothes and toiletries and made sure stuff was there? I did. Okay. And who was Alex Murdoch staying there with when he stayed there, if anybody? He never stayed there. He would just go and get his clothing and eat whatever, you know, if he would have a snack or something. He wasn't really eating. Well, during the month of August, do you remember him having a conversation with you about a shirt? Yes, sir. Did you find that to be unusual? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell them what the conversation was and why you found it unusual. Please. Um, he, he walked in um, to the little house and I was almost, I was getting ready to leave. And um, he said, B, I need to talk to you. And uh, he said, come here, sit down. So I went in the living room, I sat down, and he was pacing back and forth in the, in the living room. And he said, I got a bad feeling. He said, I got a bad feeling. He said, something's not right. And then he said, um, he said well, you know, um, there's a, um, a video. There was a video that was out. I hadn't seen a video. And he said, you remember the shirt I was wearing, that Vinnie Vine shirt? Those were, that's what he said to me. And uh, in my mind, I was saying, I don't remember a Vinnie Vine's shirt. It was the polo shirt. But I didn't mention, he said, well, you know what, I was wearing that shirt, he said, um, you know, in the, um, that day. And still, I, I was just, I didn't say anything, but I was kind of thrown back because I don't remember that. I don't remember him wearing that shirt that day when he left. I know what shirt he was wearing because I fixed the collar, and the collars are different material. I don't know what a Vinnie Vine shirt is. But when he left that day, was he wearing a Vinnie Vine shirt? Or was he wearing the collar you've described? It was a polo shirt. Oh, polo shirt. Just using your common sense, did it appear to you he was trying to tell you to say I was wearing the shirt? Speculation. is sustained as to the form of the question. How, how did you take that conversation? I felt like he was. I felt like I felt confused at first and then I know what he was wearing the day he left the house and I was basically confused I didn't really know whether he was trying to get me to say that that shirt was, if I was if I was to be asked that if that was a shirt he was wearing the day Ms. Blanca um. for ID only. Do you recognize these and do they relate to your testimony without saying what they are? Yes. Okay. 
On September 4th of 2021, did you have a conversation with Defendant Alex Murdoch? I did. Okay. And what did he ask you to do? He asked me to um, send him copy, send him a photo of the insurance cards. And do you know what day of the week that was? And I'll go back here so you can talk. I'm sorry. I, I don't remember the, the day. All I know is it's on, it's on my phone. He asked you to send him a copy of his medical card? Oh, it was on a Saturday morning because the next day was my daughter's birthday. That early that morning when he called me, he, he asked me, um, when I sent him the, the picture of the plastic insurance card, um, he said, no, I need the cardboard one. Well, the cardboard one was in Maggie's purse. Um, it wasn't in the area where I usually kept the cards in the cabinet. So I told him, I said, it's in Maggie's purse. He said, well, go ahead and, and get, the, um, get the cards and send me a picture of them. And um, I asked him if he was okay. And he said, um, well, I'm just getting some routine exams done, he said, and I need the number so I could go ahead and schedule these appointments. And it was a Saturday because I was, um, I was thinking, where's he going to go to get lab, oh, you know, uh, appointments done on a Saturday. Um, but I didn't say anything. I made, I went and I took pictures and I sent him all the copies of the cards that I found. John, we'd offer, say, 455 First of all, we obviously, he consulted with me about this as he walked up to me a moment ago. I don't quite understand the relevance. Um, why him asking for you want to tell me talking to him I'm, not. I'm sorry i'm just if he would just consult with me for a moment and tell me what the relevance is but he hadn't told me with your permission yes sir sorry your honor we sort of just talk surprise That's 455, 457 without objection. Reserving our previous objections, I apologize. Um, what, what previous objection? Sorry, what previous objection? You the, said the reserving your previous objection. I apologize, I'm just so used to saying that. I apologize. I had no previous made objection to this document concerning this issue. I apologize. You did it without objection. There you are. 455. I'll stand right here, okay? Were you texting with Alex Murdoch about sending these cards? Yes, I was. Okay. And that's the text, and is that the, his medical card you sent him a picture of? One of the medical cards I sent him a picture of, yes. Please listen to me carefully and don't go any farther than my answer to ask, okay? Yes, sir. After this date, September 4th, of 2021, did you and your husband quit living at Mazzeo? We did. Okay. Couple other questions, and I know everybody be glad I'm sitting down. Um, in addition to cleaning the house, did you ever look at Maggie's Mercedes to try to clean it afterwards? I did. What if anything did you find? As I was cleaning the vehicle, removing her. Uh, I, I would object unless she gives a date or at least a range of dates. you remember when that was? That was uh, about a week after. Okay. After, after the murders. When did you, do you remember when you cleaned her car? I, I cleaned the car when they asked me to pick it up from the um, sheriff's, the impound sheriff's department. And, and who asked you to pick it up? Randy and his wife had dropped off Paul's truck and they were getting ready to leave to go out of town. So he asked if my husband and I could go pick up the Mercedes from the impound and bring it back to the house. And did you clean it after that? I did. And what did you find, if anything? Well, she still had um, paint, 
um, for the Edisto house that she was trying to touch up some areas at the at the house and Edis she had some pillows that she was gonna return and as I moved the seat to clean um, to vacuum underneath the, the driver's side seat I found um, her ring or what her ring her wedding band now did, did Maggie based on your time with her and experience like being at Moselle by herself no. And leading up to the murders, was she anxious about anything? She had a conversation with me. She had a conversation with me um, a few months prior. Um, I, I walked in the house and um, Maggie said, hey Blanc, he said, she said, I gotta talk to you, I got something to tell you. And so, um, she said, let me make some coffee. And she went and made a pot of coffee. She made me a cup, she made herself a cup, and we went. She said, let's go talk. And I, we went into the hunting room, and uh, she closed the door, because Alec was sleeping in the bedroom, which is on the other side of the house, but she closed the door. When Maggie closed the door, um, Your side. More spots. Judge, I think, was she anxious about money issues? Uh, Your Honor, I object to well, I know you're objected, and, and <laughs> but he is I understand your objection. Judge, I'm not we, well, I don't care what you're doing. Uh, there's an objection to the previous question. The objection is sustained. While entertaining the objection, you cannot pose another question. The objection is sustained. And I apologize. Yes, sir. Your Honor, I, I hesitate, but this is a matter that needs to be put on the record. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're having you go to the jury room. Please not discuss the case. Yes, sir. If everyone will be seated. Yes. I objected to a conversation. We're, we're aware of that conversation, but I objected knowing where he was going, which was, and in that same interview, by the way, that she gave about a statement where Maggie said that she was concerned about money, she also indicated Maggie was never concerned about money. Either way, it's hearsay. He said before your honor ruled, was she concerned about money or wasn't she concerned about money? He testified, which is to hearsay, I would move for mistrial. I think it's unduly prejudicial based on the last three weeks we've heard of financial uh, 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 misconduct on the part of the defendant. Um, and and uh, if, I would move for mistrial. Um, I would move um, that it's un not mistrial because I don't think even if you give this jury an instruction, you can't unring the bell. Um, you can't correct that. Um, and now I've had to draw attention to it, even more so by objecting to it. He knew that was wrong. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Meadows. Your Honor, and, and, and for the record, I apologize for that question. I don't have to say no, it. I'm well, sorry. We're, not, we're not here about apologies. Go ahead. And I can't help it. Yes, sir. Um, Judge, under 803, and what I should have brought to the court's attention first, 8033, we think this would be admissible hearsay exception, then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. The statement of the declarant's then existing state of mind, emotion, sensation, or physical condition. Uh, we think it fits under that rule, how she was. Um, and that's all I was going to listen. That's it. I won't go, and, and, and hearsay was coming out a little bit there. A lot of hearsays come out in this trial. They wasn't objected and it just was rolling. I wasn't trying to plan that part ahead. Um, but I do think respectfully it comes in there. We'd like you to consider under 8033, Judge. 
And that's what I should have said before I asked the question. Again, for the record, say I'm sorry. 8033, the following are not excluded by the hearsay rule, even though the declarant is available as a witness. <clears throat> a statement of the declarant's then existing state of mind, emotion, sensation, or physical condition, such as intent, plan, motive, design, mental feelings, pain, and bodily health, but not including a statement of memory or belief to prove the fact remembered or believed unless it relates to the execution, revocation, identification, or terms of declarant's will. All right, Mr. Harpooley. Uh, obviously, Your Honor, I don't think that's covered by 803. Um, <clears throat> Why not? Well, because it's the declarant's and maybe we need to ask her exactly what she said before we can rule on that. Um, all, the only testimony we've heard on that point is his. Uh, we heard a, a, a question, then an objection, and then another question while the court was listening to your objection. Yes, sir. Uh, so we'll have a proffer of this testimony and see where it's, where it's going. Was Maggie Murdoch anxious of anything in the days leading up to the murder that she expressed to you? Yes, sir. Please tell the judge what it was. She was worried because a lawsuit had been presented stating that they wanted $30 million. Maggie was crying. Maggie said, I, we don't have that kind of money, Blanc. And that's what she used to call me. Um, she said, we don't have that. She said, if I, can, if I could give them everything that I got and make this go away, she said, I would do it in a heartbeat. I'm not... She said, I'll start over. We'll start over. She said, I just want it gone. Just a moment. We're listening to a proffer. Go ahead. Would that be a, instead of that long, would that be like money issues that she was worried about? The money issues dealing with the lawsuit. And Your Honor, that's all I was going to offer or I asked for money issues. I wasn't looking to even go in detail on what she said there, that long conflict. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, I, I don't quite understand um, how this fits into first the, the uh, what you allowed in under 403, 404, B, um, and race yesterday. Not prior to that. Right. Um, it is her perception that the law, her perception that the lawsuit, you know, for thirty million dollars, putting financial stress on her. Uh, there's not any. Uh, she's not relating that Alex has any stress on him. He's the one on trial. Her perception that the $30 million is making her, was concerning her. I mean, she's not accused, that is Maggie Murdoch, is not the defendant here. There's no connecting it to the defendant. Um, I don't understand what, I mean, not only is it hearsay, it's not relevant to the issues being litigated here. Her state of mind, her state of mind on financial issues, I don't know how that, how that relates. Anything further? No, sir. No. Uh, we've had testimony uh, elicited by the defense throughout the trial uh, from witnesses um, portraying the family as a loving, uh, loving and happy marriage. Uh, question posed to Mr. Gibson, I believe it was, and to the other friend of, of, of Paul's and, um, and Buster's as to whether the family was anxious or seemed to have any um, concerns or issues going on at the time. And I find that this testimony properly responds to it, to that testimony, and the objection is overruled. Anything else? <laughs> All right, uh, let's t take a one-minute stretch before the jury comes back. Thank you, the uh, last objection um, is overruled, and you may proceed. Ms. Simpson, in the days leading up to the murders of Paul and Maggie Murdoch, uh, based on your time with her, was Maggie Murdoch anxious about anything? She was concerned about the amount of money that they were requesting on that lawsuit. Thirty million is what she told me.
show you what's marked two nines. Uh, you pose a question. There's an objection. The court overruled the objection. And do you want the witness to answer the question that you posed? Yes, sir. I cheated. Well, you posed a separate question. Yes, sir. And I thought she had answered. You said she was worried about thirty million. Can you explain yes, that more? That wasn't your question. That, that, was that there was an objection to. Uh, if do you withdraw the question that you posed prior to the court's ruling on the objection? No, sir. Or you forgot the question? To the world, yes, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, pr proceed. Um, she, she was. Was she, what was she anxious about? She said. She knew the amount of money that they were asking, but she felt that Alec was not being truthful to her with regard to what exactly was going on with that lawsuit. She said, he doesn't tell me everything. Entered is 297. Get it. Get it. Monica, had you seen that before? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and I think maybe in prior statements or something, that, had you said, ha, do you recognize voices on there? Yes, sir. Who do you recognize? It's Paul, Maggie, Alec. And have previously, have you said uh, in a memo or a memorandum in interviews that you thought you may have heard another voice? Yes, sir, I did um, at, a, at a distance. But having listened to it again, have you listened to it this week? I mean, it's not a, on TV, have you seen it? I have, there's only three voices, Alec, Maggie, and Paul. So after hearing it several times, is that your conclusion? Yes, sir. Just a few more questions. Um, yes, would Ma Miss Maggie Mardall, did she go down to the kennels at night by herself? No, sir. Okay. And you say that emphatically. Why, 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 do you know that? She was scared. Okay. It got dark out there. Okay. So would she go down there by herself? No. Did she like to go down there when it wasn't dark? She did. And did she like playing with the dogs? She always took the dogs with her. Which dogs were hers? Grady and Bubba were always with her. Okay. So when she was at Edisto, where would Grady and Bubba be? She would, sometimes she would take both of them, but the majority of the time, um, in the last few months, she was um, alternating. She would take one or if not the other. Can you tell us about um, the defendants? Did you ever see him with his cell phone? Alex Murdahl, did you ever see him use his cell phone? Yes, sir. Can you tell the jury his habits with the cell phone? Would he have it a lot? Did he use it a lot? Yes, sir, he did. Okay. He was always on his phone. I'm saying that again? He was always on his phone. But, and Paul, were you familiar with his habits as regarding cell phones? Not... The times that he was there at the house, he was um, 
always on his phone. If he'd go in the shower or whatever, he'd play his country music on the phone. Um, but that's the extent that I know from what I, what I observed being there in the house. And when you were in, uh, on June 8th, and you've talked about it, and I'm not trying to rehash that, but on June 8th of 2021, when you went to clean up the house, uh, is that pretty much what you saw in the bathroom, the pants and the damp towel? Yeah, so there was a, there was a rug right as you step out of the shower, and um, there was like a slight puddle of water, a towel, a white towel, and then a pair of khaki pants. But you didn't see any bloody clothes or anything like that? No, sir. <laughs> Beg courts and dolls, it's just a few seconds, Judge. Did this, I'm sorry, Judge. Is the individual in states? Uh, is that individual in the courtroom? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and would you please? Is it Alex Murdoch sitting between Mr. Harper? Sitting and right Mr. there. Yes, sir. And the record is reflecting. Thank you, Judge. Have you ever, ever, ever seen that blue that shirt again? No, sir. Not to. Not to my knowledge. Have you ever seen these shoes again that he's wearing here? No, sir. And the spirit cloth, do you say the spirit shoes? Have you ever seen those again? No, sir. That's all. Thank you. Ma'am, my name is Dick Harpugli, and I represent the man you know as Alex, right? Yes, sir, I met you before. I don't think we've ever met before, have we? Yes, we have. We've met? Yes, sir, at the house. Maggie's funeral. Oh, at Maggie's funeral, yes. Uh, I apologize. Um, a lot of people there that day. Yes, sir. Alex has always referred to you when people ask who you are as his friend, correct? That is correct. Never called you his housekeeper, keeper, right? That is correct. Uh, he always, when, when he introduced you, as his friend. That is correct. Now, um, You've also, I think in multiple interviews with um, Sled and other folks, described, I think the words were, um, Maggie was his all. Isn't that, didn't you, isn't that what you told Sled? Yes, sir. What does that mean, Maggie was his all? He, he adored her. He, he loved her. He adored her. Worshipped her. I mean, just treated her as somebody he adored, correct? Exactly, yes, sir. Now, I think they also asked you if you ever saw them have any arguments, and No, I did not ask that object objection. You restate the question, please. Sweat asked you if you'd ever seen them have any arguments. I don't quite understand the basis of the objection, Your Honor. You restated the question. You may respond. What was the question again, sir? Did you ever see them have any arguments? I never saw them have arguments. It was just minor disagreement because of the remodeling. And I think you cite specifically they had, when you said they had arguments, it was about the paint colors, for instance. One of them was Maggie was set on getting a certain white and Alec was saying just get whatever white, basically. You know, he didn't care. She wanted a specific white. 
and he just didn't uh, care. But you never saw them have any violent arguments or argue about money or argue about relationships. It was all the minor things that most couples go through, um, picking paint colors and those kinds of things. Is that correct? Yes, sir. To, to some, they would disagree on... It wasn't that they disagreed. The only thing that I remember Maggie saying was that she just wanted him to sit still and listen to her for at least 10 minutes at a time because he was always on the go. Is that an uncommon complaint between husbands and wives or wives to husbands? I want you to just listen to me. Is that right? She, just was, she would get frustrated because of that. Right. Do you ever tell your husband that? Just listen to me. Sit, please. All the time. Okay. So um, let me talk a little bit about <coughs> the um, morning of the 7th yes, sir. and then the morning of the 8th because I understand you left before um, Paul, Maggie, or Alec was on the Moselle property on the 7th, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And we're going to talk about those texts in just a minute between you and Maggie, but um, you fixed some dinner for them. I did. And did you set a table, or did they have to go get their own plates and put them no, out? No, I left the food on the stove. Right. Um, and, and normally, the next day, the pots would still be on the stove, right? Yes, sir. Would they clean up their plates or leave those in the sink, or how would that go? Sometimes uh, the plates would be in the living room. There was no plates in the living room. Um, they were in the sink. Okay, but when you got there on the morning of the 8th? The were plates in the were in the sink. They were not in the living room. Okay, now, are you aware of how many people were in there, how many friends, law partners, his sister, who was in the Moselle house on the night of the 7th? No, sir. Okay, if I told you there were 12 to 15 of them, would that surprise you? I mean, Maggie and Paul just been killed. Was he very close with his law partners? Yes, sir. Okay, his sister, Lynn? Do you know Lynn? I don't, I, I met her at um, Maggie's, when Maggie passed. Okay. Um, and would it surprise you to know that the... Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to object. I'm going to ask her if she knows, Your Honor. Well, the objection is sustained. You cannot testify. Well, I'm going to make it more general than this. Do you know if anyone that evening of those p people moved the food from the stovetop to the refrigerator? I don't know. Okay. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the, um, the um, room, the, the, the bedroom and, well, let me ask you this. Let's back off just a little bit. You drove over from his mother and father's house, correct? That is correct. That morning, the 8th, to Moselle, right? Yes, sir. And instead of coming in your normal way, which would have been the entrance by the kennels, where there were, did you see all the police down there? No, sir, I did not. Okay. You drove up to the main entrance that would go straight up to the house, or if you took a right on that road, you'd end up to back down at the kennels, right? Yes, sir. And you came up that, were there police around the, the, the house up there? Not around the house. Okay. Did anyone question whether you should go into the house or not? No, sir. Were there any, was there anybody in the house other than you? No, sir. It was me. So did you find it strange that this was a crime scene? Objection. I need to hear the question. I'm sorry. The question would be, did you find it strange there was no law enforcement present at the house that morning? Yeah, that's the question. Go ahead. It wasn't strange because there was law enforcement all over on the kennel side. It wasn't strange that they allowed me to go into the house. Well, let me ask you this. Did anybody from SLED show up while you were there that morning? I believe there was an officer. I do not recall the officers. Do you remember somebody coming in to search the house while you were there? There were several agents that came through. Right. But Okay, but you'd been there for a while before they got there? Yes, sir. Did they ask you about clothes you'd found, or did they ask you about anything that you found out of the ordinary, anything like that? I didn't ask any questions. They didn't ask me. They just went about doing what they were doing. 
And were they going from room to room? Were they looking for things under the bed? Do you, do you remember? It appeared that that's what they were doing, sir. Okay. But that was after you got there and picked up the bathroom, picked up the, 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 the mm -hmm. towel. No, sir. I hadn't picked up anything at that point because I was still in shock and I was still trying to process what had just happened to my friend. So they would have seen the khaki pants on the floor. Objection. Did they go into the bathroom? I couldn't tell you, sir. Okay. The, ba the, the, the laundry room sits on the other side of the house, and I had to take some time to process what had happened to Maggie and Paul. I didn't, I know I saw agents that went upstairs to Paul's room. I, I saw them walking through the house, sir, but I don't, I don't know what they took, what they didn't took. All I can tell you is what I saw when I got there. Okay after while they're there or after they left is that when you went into the bathroom and saw the khaki pants somebody taking a shower um there was a towel on the floor khaki pants on the floor was that before or after they left yeah after okay so all those items would have been they would have been there for those folks to see as far as you know yes sir now let me ask you a couple of things and, and, and about what you saw. The, the, they keep showing you this picture by the tree of Alex, and he appears to have on a khaki pair of pants in that picture, correct? Yes, sir. And um, I mean, he, I'm sure he had a number of different pairs of khaki pants, but were those khaki pants similar to the ones he has on in the picture? Could they be the same ones? They could be, but he had several. Right. Um, and in terms of um, somebody had taken a shower, it looked like there was water on the floor? Yes, sir. Now, did Alex take a number of showers every day? Was he a pro prolific shower taker? Not that I'm aware. He would get up in the morning, take a shower, and go to work. But did he take showers other times during the day? I wasn't there in the evening hours, so okay. I don't know. Okay. So, but it wasn't, wasn't unusual for when you got there to find a a towel on the floor and water on the floor from him having, having taken that a wasn't shower. unusual no. okay and um i think that when you were asked about a shirt and we can pull this if you want to go back to whether there was a shirt there also you said you couldn't remember is that correct with regard to whether there was a shirt with the khakis on the floor you said i couldn't remember I could not remember whether there was a shirt with a khaki pants. All I remember is a white, damp towel sitting there. Okay, and the khaki pants. Yes, sir. But you don't remember the what, whether, and I think you told the grand jury, I don't remember whether it was a shirt or wasn't a shirt, correct? That is correct. And that's today. You can't tell this jury there wasn't a shirt on the floor. You just can't, you can tell them you don't remember, correct? What was your question? You can't tell this jury there wasn't a shirt on the floor because you can't remember whether there was a shirt on the floor or not. Isn't that what you told the grand jury? Yes, sir. Okay. So we know there's a pair of khaki pants. There may have been a shirt. Um, and those shoes, um, well, let me ask you this. Do you know on the night of the 7th? Yes, sir. Alec had left, correct? He wasn't there when you got there the next morning. No, sir, he wasn't there. Okay. And matter of fact, he never spent another night at Moselle that no, you sir, he did your not. Honor. She knows your honor. Can answer if you know whether or not he's ever spent another night there. after the murders did he ever spend another night at Moselle to your knowledge he did not so when he left that night on the night of the 7th and went to um, his mother and father's house you don't know what clothes he took with him what shoes he was wearing you have no idea correct that is correct um, and um, were you aware that sled had confiscated the clothes that he had on at that moment, I didn't. Okay. Well, you are now. Yes, sir. I do know now. Okay. A white T-shirt, pair of shorts that he showed you, and um, whatever, uh, whatever shoes he had on, some sneakers, right? I didn't see the sneakers, but I saw the clothing items. Okay. And um, so he had to put on, if they did that, other clothes to go over his mother's house, correct? Objection. Would it stand to reason he'd have to put on other clothes or go in his underwear? I would assume so, yes. Okay. Do you know what he wore over to his mother's house? No, sir. Do you know whether he wore those shoes? No, sir. You don't know 
So you we objection to objection. Basis for the objection. To which know, question? To that last one, shoes. I don't know what specificity he says to those shoes. I don't know what he's. I'm sorry. The shoes that you say you saw in the Snapchat photo, you say you never saw again, right? That is correct. Okay. You don't know whether he wrote he drew, uh, wore those shoes the night of the seventh over to his mama's house, do you? I don't know that. I wasn't okay. there. And you don't know what he wore over there, correct? That's correct. I wasn't there. He may have even worn that shirt that you said you never saw again, correct? Objection. Objections overruled. Right? Correct. Okay. Now, if somebody alleged that those khaki pants were was at what Alex was wearing the night of the I'm object. I need to hear the question. I, I, I can't finish the question. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Let me state this. If somebody were to say that Alec Murdoch, as ridiculous as it sounds, was wearing those khaki pants when he... Objection. Objection sustained. Okay. Let me put it this way. Did you see any blood on those khaki pants? No, sir. He washed them, right? <coughs> yes, sir. Did you put anything on them to get blood stains out? I mean, uh, would there be... Are you being saying that I, that I removed blood stains off of khaki pants? I'm asking you rhetorically. I'm asking you, did, did you see any blood stains? There appeared to be no blood stains okay. on those pants. Okay. And in the bathroom, did you see any bloody footprints? I did not. Did you see any blood on that towel? No, sir. Did you see anything indicating to you there had been anybody wearing bloody shoes or washing off, after, washing blood off, or anything that would indicate that somebody, after a murder, had gone back to that room, changed clothes, covered in blood, uh, took a shower and changed Objection. clothes? Did you see anything that would indicate that? Objection's overruled. Go ahead. I've, this is the first time that I have ever been in a situation where somebody was murdered. Right. I didn't know, as far as what you're asking me, if there was anything bloody in there. No, it did not appear to be anything bloody in there. Did you clean the shower that day? Yes, sir, I rinsed it off. You rinsed it off. Nobody told you not to rinse off the shower? No, sir. Okay. And again, nobody from SWED, as that group went through, asked you, you know, did you see bloody footprints? Did you see any evidence that there was anything bloody in that, sh that bathroom? <coughs> did anybody ask you that? No, sir. And your testimony is those khaki pants were there after Sled left? Yes, sir. And maybe even a shirt you can't remember? Yes, or possibly a T-shirt, but I did not see it. I, I don't remember. Okay, you don't remember what kind of shirt, if there was a shirt. Not objection. The objection is overruled. Thank you. Do you remember, you know, I'm doing like Mr. Meadows now, I forgot the question. But let me see if I can get this back on track. This, in, these interruptions are getting me a little askew. Um, so, I think you've already asked and answered that. Now, let's talk a little bit about, let me talk a little bit about the cell phone service in Moselle. You had a cell phone? Yes, sir. And the servicer was who? What, what was it, Verizon? Or do you the, know? the cell phone carrier is Verizon, yes, sir. Okay. And so, did you ever have any trouble getting a signal anywhere on the Moselle property, up at the house, down at the dog kennels? Was it sporadic? Yes, sir, it was. Okay, and sometimes you'd be talking to somebody and they'd drop off, or you'd, you'd, the call would end, not because you ended it, because the service was bad. Yes, sir, if you were moving around in the house, certain areas, you could not get a signal. What about down from the kennels? It was, it was touch and go in the kennels. You, you really, you, you, once you got signal, you better stay where you were at, because if you moved, you were gonna lose your signal. Okay. So it would not be unusual at the kennels if you did move 
um, that if you were having a conversation or getting text or trying to answer a text, you wouldn't be able to do so. It, like I said, it depends on where you were. You kind of knew the areas. At least for me, I already knew that if I had to make a call or send a text, I would walk out the kitchen door straight to the edge of the corner right there on the porch and make my call and not move. If not, I would lose the call or I, w I would not be able to make my call. What about at the kennels? At the kennels, like I said, it depends on the area where you were at. And once, basically everybody, we all kind of knew that if you moved out of a certain area and went to another, you were going to lose signal. Okay. Now, at the kennel, do you know what area you could get a call? Keep that, I mean, was there a, you just talked about up at the house, there was a sweet spot, if you'll pardon yes, me, sir. Everybody was there a sweet spot down at the kennel, or do you know? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure at the kennels, but I do remember um, Mr. CB saying that the signal out there was horrible um, for okay. making calls or getting calls. Or making, sending texts or getting texts. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, let, me, let me talk to you a little bit about this conversation in August of, of 21 after the murders. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, Al came over and uh, was inquiring of you what shirt he had on that day, correct? It didn't feel like he was inquiring. It felt more like he was trying to convince me of the shirt that he was wearing. Did he tell you that he just finished? Objection. I'm sorry. I'm just asking if he told you something. Objection. It's cross-examination. Uh, not objecting to hearsay for the record. I need to hear the question, um, Did, uh, number I'm, one. Uh, number two is cross-examination. Go ahead. Did he tell you that he just finished Objection. meeting? Do you want me to pose the question, Your Honor, or not? All right. I'm going to send the jury to the jury room. Please do not discuss the case. Be seated. Okay, what is the question? Just wait one second, Your Honor. Let me see if I can get back on track. When you were talk talking with him in the little house in August, as we were talking about a moment ago, and he was talking about the shirt, did he tell you that he had just been interviewed by Swed, who'd shown him the Snapchat photo? and he was uh, attempting to figure out what he was wearing that day. I mean, it's in a photo. Did he tell you that? Um, you, what's the specific question? Did he, in the con in, in, when he asked you the question about the shirt, did he tell you he'd just come from being interviewed by Sweat? No, sir, he didn't tell me that. Um, and what is the objection? Your Honor, it is respectfully it's hearsay statement is hearsay that if he wants to do that he can take the stand and do it he's trying to offer the defendant's statement without him taking the stand it's offered for the truth of the matter asserted that's my objection all right in response uh, my response is if you can't ask witnesses about what the defendant said to them they're going to have a rough 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 road to hoe going forward because um it's a statement by the party um party opponent, if you will. I think they argued earlier on when we objected to one. It's not hearsay. There's an exception to hearsay by a statement by one of the parties. It's Alex. A statement by the party opponent being a, a statement by the party opponent, uh, the defendant. Mr. Murdoch's statement to this woman. Murders. Not this matters. I've been doing this 35 years. He's on trial. Uh, we uh, know that. Um, but I'm just saying it's, it's not a party opponent. He's trying to get in a statement from the defendant. Uh, statements against interest that the state, there is a difference between the state asking what the defendant said and the defense. And if they hadn't objected to some, they thought that's their 
prerogative, but they're trying to offer the defendant's statement in evidence without him taking the stand. And, and it, I, I respectfully think that's objectable as hearsay. He's the defendant on trial. They're offering it for the uh, self-serving hearsay. Uh, they're offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. And I respectfully think that he's got to stand, take the stand and get that information in. And Your Honor, maybe I'll make this sense. Did he tell you about talking to Sweat that day? No, sir, he did not. Okay. And Your Honor, 801 D2 allows us to ask the question and not the defense. I don't understand what the self serving is. She didn't say anything. He didn't say anything about Sweat. Your Honor, he could get his whole case through witnesses and he wouldn't have to take the stand. I, I, Absolutely. And that's He's not got appropriate. a Fifth Amendment right no, sir. to not take the stand. That's right, but you can't. I think Brent will let you all. Debate the issue between the two. I apologize. I'll right. when I get back. Sorry. All right. All right. Thank you. The objection is sustained. Your next question. Please support, Your Honor. Yes, sir. So um, this conversation occurred. I think. Did you say prior to them going on a golf tournament, going to a golf tournament? Yes, sir. He said okay. Randy had just dropped him off so that he could get his clothes because they were him and Buster and Randy were going golfing. Him and Buster and who? Randy. Randy, okay. We're going to a golf tournament that weekend? I don't know if it was a golf tournament or what, but I know he said they were going away, they were going golfing. Okay. Um, and speaking of Buster, um, can you point Buster out in the uh, audience for me, please? Buster, where, oh, you're back there. Okay, I'm sorry. Stand up, please. Yes, sir. Is that Buster? Yes, sir. Okay, you all always had a great relationship, right? Yes, sir. Okay, He's thank you. He's a good you. kid. I'm sorry? He's a good kid. He's a good kid. Okay, so um, one of the other questions I have is, did, did you ever see Paul with any guns? Yes, sir. No? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. And did he have guns around all the time? Yes, he did. Matter of fact, they're all guns all over that place, right? In the vehicles, on the go-karts, sometimes in the hangar. So um, did uh, Paul ever leave guns? Just where, if he was, for instance, down at the, uh, uh, the hangar, would he ever leave guns down there? I have found one occasionally out there. A pistol or a rifle? A rifle. You know what kind it was? No, sir. Okay. And um, do you know if he ever left any down in the feed room? Not in the feed room. I, I'm not sure you, about you, the feed okay, room. Okay, you never saw anything in the no, feed sir. room. Um, I believe I, in one of your statements I read that sometimes he'd leave him somewhere and those the, actually there'd be rust on the rifle or the shotgun or whatever. If he left it on the, on the golf cart outside, he would sometimes leave it laying across and I would get it in the morning and already the dew would, it would rust off. And that would be a golf cart he would drive down to the kennels? For instance? Yes, sir. Whichever one he was in, and he preferred the gas. The gas one is usually where I used to find. Gas? Go, uh, golf, golf cart? cart? Yes. Okay. And so that would be a way he would get down to the um, kennel sometimes? Sometimes. The majority of the time he was either, either in Dolly or in his own truck. In what? Dolly. What is Dolly? Um, the F-250. I forgot y'all name all your trucks, or they named all their trucks, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so um, most of the time he would be in a truck, but sometimes he would take the uh, golf cart, if you will, down there. Yes, sir. And apparently sometimes he had guns in the golf cart. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, let me touch a couple of other things. Um, <coughs> Did uh, that day you saw the sled folks in there, um, did you see them taking any pictures? Or do you remember? I believe some of them were taking pictures, but I'm not, I'm not positive. Okay. Um, you were shown a picture of a rain jacket? Yes, sir, I was. Okay, and had you ever seen that rain jacket at the house? Not at Moselle, no, sir. Correct. You ever, um, and what size clothes did, um, did Alec wear? 2XL. 2XL. 
not just a large. Would anything a large fit him? I don't think he he might have had one or two items that were that size, but most of the clothing was 2XL. 2XL. Um, how about, would you put the exhibit number? Yes, please. And blow it up for me, please. Okay, how, how about make that bigger for me, please? No, no, not the rain jacket. I'm sorry, the um, um, Snapchat picture. I apologize. Well, wait one second. Do you see that rain jacket on there? Yes, I That's You've never seen that, according to your statement, never seen that at I've never seen that jacket. Okay. And you knew pretty much everything, every piece of clothing that was there, right? For the most part, yes. Yes. Okay. And how many rain jackets did, uh, did uh, Alex have? Do you remember? Too many to count. Too many to count. Okay. <laughs> but none of them looked like that. No, sir. Okay. How about blow that up for me, please? Can you make it any, any better, closer? Yeah, that's good right there. Um, and that shirt is, is that the one he was wearing that morning? When he no, left? sir, it was not. It's not? No, sir, that was not the shirt he was wearing. And this is at 7, you understand this is 7.40 p.m. Uh, that evening when he's out with Paul. I wasn't there then. Okay, but that's not the shirt he was wearing when he left that morning. That is correct. No, it's not the shirt. Okay, thank you, course, indulge one moment. <coughs> um, you were aware he had clothes at his office, kept clothes at his office? Yes, sir. Among other places. Where else would he leave? Have car. clothes? Car. Having a car. Yes, sir. Where else? Um, in Edisto. I'm sorry. In Edisto. In Edisto. Okay. But if he was in the Moselle area, if he was going to change his shirt from in the morning, would he have changed it at the office or got something out of his car? I. You don't know? I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay. Um, now, let me uh, show you. Tell the jury what that is, please. The text messages from me and Maggie. Okay, and this is on uh, June 7th, 2021, right? That is correct. And the first one, I'm just going to try to hurry this up a little bit. She asked you to stop. Yes, sir. She says, will you stop by, this is at 7.05 a.m., stop by the store and get Alex Capri Sons. He likes orange and pineapple flavor plus mountain cooler. Thank you, I'll pay you back. You say, I will. She says, thank you, get two boxes. Now, after that conversation, uh, there's a text it's at 3.28 p.m. Blanca, dinner's on the stove, just left. She left there um, at about 3.30, correct? Yes, I sent the text before um, I actually walked out of the house. I had a habit of sending her the text, make sure everything, and then locked up before I left. Okay. But at that time, I, w I had gone upstairs to drop off some clothes, um, and um, I noticed that Paul's truck, or a white truck, was sitting at the kennels, so I left the, do the front door unlocked at that time okay. instead of locking but it. But you didn't see Alec anywhere there? Front no, sir. Okay. You didn't see his vehicle? No, sir. Okay. And she says at 340, thank you, right? Yes, sir. 
Okay, then at 354, you said, you're welcome, I just made your deposit. Maggie then says, I guess this is a fun exchange, thank you, I'm waiting at the doctor. Alex wants me to come home. I had to leave the door open at Edisto, but trust the Mexicans to shut and lock for me. Yes, sir. Um, and then she says, Alex's dad back at the hospital. The, do the last doctor claims not cancer pneumonia. Alex is about to die. Hope he doesn't go down there to sleep. Now, you know what she meant by that? What she meant was she used to, Maggie used to get frustrated. She said every time something happened at Almeida with his dad or his mom that Alec would get called and nobody else, that they always called Alec to go to the house. And she did get upset over that, that the family was basically putting all that on Alec and he wasn't getting enough rest. So when she said he's going to die, she's worried about his health. She was worried about his health, yes. Okay. Um, and she says Alex needs to take care of himself as well. And that's consistent with what you just said, correct? She was yes. worried about his health. Yes. Um, and you said, yes, he does. He told me he was tired when he left. I hope they can treat Mr. Randolph. Maggie says, I'm scared for him and Alex and all of us. What do you mean by that? Because Alex hadn't had much sleep. They, that was her main concern was the fact that her main frustration was the fact that in the middle of the night or whenever, you know, if Mr. Randolph or Ms. Libby were uncomfortable that they would always, she seemed to think that they always called Alec and there goes Alec, you know, to take care of it. And she felt that it wasn't fair that he was the only one having to take him. And, and your response to that is, I know, just pray about it and hope he gets a little better. Is that what you said? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and you say, Alex, and you really need to relax. Always being on the go with little uh, or no sleep is not healthy. Remember, I have a doctor's appointment in the morning in Beaufort. If I get done early, I'll go to Moselle. I'll let you know. And she says, no worries, right? Yes. Um, now, what did I do with it? oh, you've got the exhibit. Take that from me and hand it to So, <clears throat> she preferred to be in um, Edisto, correct? That is correct. Um, but she was going that day, based on your, all your texts, she was going because Mr. Randolph had been put back in the hospital and she was worried about Alex, right? I mean, she was heading to Moselle. She preferred to be in Edisto, but she was heading to Moselle because Mr. Randolph had been put back in the hospital, and she was concerned about Alex. Isn't that what this Objection. is? Your objection is sustained. Okay. Um, she, she indicated to you that Paul was coming in your telephone conversations, correct? That is correct. And did she indicate in your telephone conversations uh, that she needed dinner for her, Paul, and Alec, right? Yes, she did. And did she indicate in any way um, that she did not want to go to Moselle to have dinner with Alec, Paul, um, that night? Her conversation with me was that Alec wanted her to go to Moselle that day. And she was concerned about the workers that she had in Edisto and she would have preferred to be in Edisto, taking care of the final but for, details. But for Mr. Randolph's condition. She was, she was concerned about the work being done and leaving the house open in Edisto. She wasn't concerned about Mr. Randolph. I mean, she was, I mean, but her concern, more concern was that her house was open. Okay. Now, um, I mean, she preferred to be at Edisto <laughs> in the summertime as opposed to Moselle at all, correct? That is correct. Um, now, um, let me ask you, um, did SWED ask you about the, at any point, about the clothes that uh, Alex was wearing 
on the seventh. At some point, did they ask you that? Not until recent. Recently, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, <clears throat> is it clear uh, to you? I mean, you've been asked recently to re recollect something that happened in June of 21, um, which is almost two years ago. Um, is it, it, did, they, did they ask you other questions about what happened on June 7th when they asked you about the close? They asked me where I was. Um, they asked me what I was doing. They asked me when I saw Alec leaving that day, my discussions with Maggie. They requested to see my phone, which I gave them um, so they could see the text messages phone calls that we had had. Okay. Um, you and Maggie were very close. We were. You and Alex were close also, were you not? Yes, sir. Um, and did you feel like a member of the family? Yes, sir. Um, had you ever heard uh, from anybody about any, th well, strike that. Did you indicate that Maggie, one of the things Maggie told you was that she was not, after the boat case, she was not being treated very well by the people in Hampton, correct? That is correct. Um, they shunned her, they were rude to her, those kinds of things. That is correct. Did she also indicate to you that, that, that she was concerned about Paul because he'd received a bunch of threats? Objection. The objection's overruled. Did she ever indicate to you she's concerned about Paul because Paul had received threats? Yes. Okay, beg the court's indulgence. Um, that same morning of the eighth, did you clean the gun room? I didn't go in the in the gun room. I went I went in there, but I didn't do anything in the gun room. Didn't pick anything up. No, sir. Okay, and when you went into the kitchen that morning, was there anything that would indicate to you that other people had been there the night before, like glasses or bottles of water or anything? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Harputlian. It's got a couple of questions. Mr. Harputlian asked you about the um, clothes in the closet on June 8, 2021. You remember? Yes, sir. And he asked you if there could have been another shirt in the room. Yes, sir. And was your response maybe, maybe a t shirt? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you see another dress shirt there? No, sir. Okay. And while we're getting to that, did you work at Almeda? No, sir. Did you ever go there? No, I have been there on one occasion previously, and I don't remember what I had to drop off. Well, that blue um, poncho rain jacket, Mr. Or Putin show you well, that was at Almeida, wasn't it? Or do you know? I don't know where that came from. 
But you never saw that at Moselle, correct? That is correct. Okay. And state seven, well, first of all, this is states two, states 306. Have you ever seen that shirt again since you went back the eighth? The ninth until today, have you ever seen that shirt again? No, sir. Once I um, moved all a lot of the belongings to the little house, um, he had packed some of the clothes up. But over the weekends and stuff, when they were going from place to place, they, I noticed that he was purchasing different clothing items, shorts, shirts. So there was a couple of new ones in there, which. Um, still was not that shirt. It was a lot of, some of the newer ones. Who was purchasing, purchase, purchasing a lot of shorts and shirts? Alec. After this event? After, after the murder? Yes, sir, on the weekends when, when they were gone with the family, um, if he was going different places, he would come back like that Monday or Tuesday and there was like new items within the clothes. New shirts? New shirts. New shorts? Yes. Okay. You know what kind? Vineyard vines. They were buying many vines. Yes, sir. After the murders. Yes, sir. They were like polo type vineyard vines. And what shirt had he suggested to you he was wearing in August on this day? What shirt had he had just suggested to you he was wearing? Vineyard vines. Vinny vines is what he called them. In in state seven. Did you recognize these shorts and shirts? Yes, sir. Where was this shirt kept on States 107 in, in Moselle? In the, in the closet, if there was no room in that drawer. On the shelves? Yes, sir, on the shelf. And looking at 306, is that outfit different from this outfit? Yes, sir, it is. And I think Mr. Arpuglian showed you 107. Whose idea was it for Maggie Murdahl to come to Moselle on the evening of June 7th? Objection, Your Honor. You can testify if you know. Your Honor, here's that. You can testify if you know. Maggie texted me that Alec wanted her to come to Moselle. And is that on 107 that Mr. Harpootley had just put in? Yes, sir, it is. That's all, thank you. Further. Just a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Put that up in the question. Um, just a, a couple questions. Um, after Maggie's death and Paul's death, did you notice he was losing weight? Yes, sir, he was. Dramatic loss of weight, right? Yes. So the clothes he, uh, he we can see him in that picture, he's a, well, fat is a long word, but overweight kind of guy, big guy, fleshy looking guy, right there, okay? Now, the, um, so he needed to buy new clothes because the other clothes were falling off of him, right? I, I assume so, yes. Yeah. So it wouldn't be unusual for him to need to buy new clothes because he's losing weight. I guess. Okay. Now, this is um, 306. This is the picture. Um, and you say this is a shirt, like a Columbia shirt, right? Yes, sir. Now, a Columbia shirt, don't they have a logo that says Columbia? Yes, sir. You know, the sleeve or you see one on here? I don't. I don't see anything on this shirt. I'm okay. to style a shirt is a Columbia style okay. shirt. That's, that's not a. You're, you're not saying it was a brand name Columbia shirt. You're saying it was a Columbia style shirt. 
Yes, sir. Okay. And um, your testimony, again, is this is not the shirt he walked out with that morning. He did not walk out with that shirt that morning. But those could be the khakis he walked out with that morning. Possibly, yes. Okay. And when you say you never saw that shirt again, you did see those khakis again, did you not? Yes, sir. I watched those khakis. They were in the bathroom. I'm assuming it was the same pair because he only had a few that he wore. Right. Okay. And um, in addition, um, <coughs> your testimony would be <coughs> that the only, well, I guess you're saying that morning he didn't have that shirt on, but he had those pants on. Could possibly have those pants. He had several. Okay. Um, and would you scroll down to the footwear, please? Those are loafers, right? Yes, sir. And what do they seem to be made out of? Like soft leather. So uh, your testimony is that he, those were house shoes he only wore around the house. He had like house slippers. Usually when Alec would go outside, he had them Georgia boots that he would wear or the duck boots. And those would be left by the front door when I would walk through the door in the next morning. In June, it was pretty hot down there. In Moselle. Yes, sir, but those were his go-to shoes okay. when he would go um, outside or mess around, like he said, with Paul that day. What kind of shoes was he wearing when he went to work that day? The dress shoes, a pair of uh, brown leather. Okay. Now, were you, when were you first asked about what he was wearing that day? Um, a couple, maybe a couple of days when they interviewed me. When they interviewed you the first time? Yes, sir. They asked you what he, he had on? Yes, sir. Okay. You may step down.